Okay, so we're on 156. We're talking about fish. And here is a bony fish. We learned, hopefully you learned all the things of the fins. you got to know those. That'll be on the next test. Caudal fin is the fin in the back. There's usually two dorsal fins on top, the first dorsal and the second dorsal. The anal fin is in the back. The pelvic fin is kind of more toward the front of the body. Sometimes it's further back, but it kind of hangs down on the bottom. And the pectoral fin comes out the sides. The operculum is a bony covering of the gills. Sharks don't have anything covering their gills, but bony fish do. They have an operculum, and that's a flap that covers the gills up, and it can kind of shut off water coming out or open up and let more water out. That's the eye, lip, tail, gives big lip. Um, they've got scales that are called cycloid or stenoid. <coughs> They're different from the shark scales. They aren't as sharp. They're either round or kind of uh, rectangular. Um, and we'll have a chance to look at those under the microscope tomorrow when we do our dissection. There's a lateral line there. That's used to sense, that's like an ear, basically, that travels all the way down. And it can sense currents. And it can feel the current all along its lateral line. It has a real good sense of how the water's coming. So if you've ever been diving and tried to catch a fish, if you're moving your hand toward that fish, your hand is pushing water in front of it. And that water will hit the lateral line of the fish, and it'll feel the movement of the current, and, and it'll know, it'll be able to kind of draw a picture of it in its mind of what's coming at it, even if it's dark and it can't see. And so they'll go right around your hand. You won't be able to grab them. They can feel it. Isn't that cool? Um, they got a little bitty brain and a nerve cord running down, just like all other vertebrates. There are the gills. Blood goes into the gills, and as the water comes through their mouth, it goes out through the gill openings in their sides, and the, the gills strain oxygen from the water. Fish use about one-fourth of their energy to get oxygen from the water, whereas we only use about maybe 5% of our energy when we're breathing to get oxygen in and out of our body. They use like a fourth. So it's really expensive for fish to get oxygen. There's a couple reasons for that. Oxygen is more plentiful in the air than in the water. There's more of it. And the water's thick, and it takes, it takes a lot of energy to move water through your body. You have to swim along to get the water to move. Or you can use those opercula and have them do like this, and it kind of pumps water through. And so sometimes you'll see fish just kind of sitting there, and they're kind of they're going like that, and they're and 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 they're you might see their operculum working like this. They're just kind of pumping water through. In the video we watched, it said that they're taking water through their gills, which is not true. Hmm. They take it into their mouth. Yeah, it comes in through the mouth and out the gill. Of the so it's Maybe some fish can do it, I don't know. This right here, this big blue thing, is the swim bladder. It's an oxygen holding, I'm sorry, it's an, it's an air holding balloon, basically, inside their body. And what, what happens is, if the fish wants to control its buoyancy, it uses the swim bladder. It'll take, um, oxygen and move it into the swim bladder and then the the fish will rise in the water and if it wants to go down in the water it just releases oxygen from its swim bladder and then it'll go down so it controls the depth sharks can't do this because sharks don't have a swim bladder so
So a shark, if it wants to go up in the water, it has to swim and go higher. And uh, so this is an advantage that bony fish have that sharks don't. And we managed to see a lot of these parts when we did our shark dissection. You'll probably see it tomorrow. We're dissecting a perch. You ever heard of a perch? It's a type of fish. Fish have all sorts of different body shapes. They're all they're specialized, and there's a whole couple of pages uh, reading about the body shape and the coloration. This is a flounder. Flounders, and there are some other types of fish too, have a flat body shape, kind of like a ray does, and it'll lay at the bottom of the ocean. It'll kind of flap a bit to not mud up in the air and the mud settles onto its body and it'll just be hidden down at the bottom of the ocean. There, a guy caught a real big flounder. Catch any fl flounders out there, Trey? Now and then. What's that? Now and then? Yeah. Anyone that big? No. It's a pretty big one. It's a little video about flounders. They're pretty cool. Master of the sky. Or maybe not. Your director flounder was called here. Scott here? At the pier. Really? I didn't know that. Flounder. The very word makes the fish <laughs> seem helpless and confused. And that's just what they want you to think. Camouflage scales help them look like a seabed. Once within range, they strike with sudden speed. This is a shrimp, aka dinner. The flounder hides under a thin covering of sand. Only its eyes peek out. Strangely enough, when a flounder is born, its eyes are on either side of its body. As it matures, one eye migrates to the other side, giving it the characteristic flat shape that allows it to hide so well. The shrimp senses danger, but it's too late. But the flounder's hungry movements don't go undetected. Osprey senses an easy snack. The flounder attempts to disguise itself again. But the sands are too sparse and the water too shallow. The eater is eaten. And the cycle of life continues. While other, better disguised flounder live on. Size? Almost something. Almost something. 
Homo meaning the same. Homo cercal. C E R C A M. So you see these these fins. Uh, anytime you have a fast fish, they'll have a streamlined body, kind of inflexible fins, and a tail is kind of shaped like that. And where the tail comes in to meet the body is real thin right here. And what that does is here's the fish's body. Here's the fish. Um, the fish has all kinds of different muscle fibers. <coughs> so, whoops. The fish has muscles, you see, that all come down. These, these little lines are all muscles. And all the muscles basically are meeting at one point when it gets real thin like this. And so this one point is attached to the fin. This, there's just, so there's just a single point of attachment, which means there's a whole lot of muscle moving this fin back and forth. If it's not, is it, if it doesn't come to a small point right there, if it's, if it's fatter like this, then what ends up happening is it doesn't, all the muscle isn't concentrated at one point, it spreads out. So this muscle moves the top of the fin, this muscle moves the bottom of the fin, they can usually move, um, separate from one another, and it doesn't create as fast a fish. So if you ever see a tiny point of concentration coming into the caudal fin, that's a fast fish. It's meant for speed. If it's ever spread out like this going into the caudal fin, that's a slow fish. It's meant for that kind of fish can maneuver quickly. You find fish that can maneuver very quickly in coral reefs, in areas where you can dart around and hide behind things, mangrove forests and such, um, kelp forests. You find fast fish out in the open ocean because you, you do better in the open ocean if you're real fast. You can run from things and you can catch them. Here are some of these, see these billfish, look, they all have that small area there. Look at that. These are tuna, fast fish. This shows, um, another thing we can talk about here is these billfish, they have this, this front spike that come out. They're bill. You know what that's for? Starting their prey. Yeah, what they do is uh, a lot of fish have what's called schooling behavior. And schooling behavior means there's a bunch of fish in one area. And you, most fish can't catch fish when they're in a school because all these fish are moving around. And I'll show you in this video, the fish can kind of all move together and confuse a predator that's trying to catch them. And so schooling behavior is a cool way to keep from getting caught. Birds do it too. You've seen a flock of birds all flying together. You can't, if you're a hawk or something trying to catch one of those birds, you can't focus on any singular bird. And the movement of the, of the whole flock will confuse you and you'll not be able to catch anything. So what these guys evolved with this long bill. And what they do is they, they slowly swim into the school and all these fish are around them, and then they turn their head sideways real fast. And the combination of that knocks out some of the fish, because they can't move fast enough to get out of the way of this bill. So they, they, can, they don't actually slowly move in, they, they, they'll quickly move into the, uh, the school and, and turn their head and be able to knock them out, even though they can't focus on one individual. When they stun a fish, then it's just floating there, and then they can eat them. It's a, it's a way that they've adapted to catch schooling fish. So they're fat. These ones right here are not only fast, but they've adapted this special bill to, to catch schooling fish. You ever caught any of these? Yeah? Around here, did you go 
All the way out. Mexico. Mexico. Our waters aren't really deep enough to find many fish like that around here. You usually got to go out 80 miles. Yeah, 80 miles to the Gulf Stream. 20. Ocean-going hunters are never far away. Silky sharks specialize in picking off injured fish and constantly check over the residents around the sea mount. At some times of the year, seasonal changes make the currents especially rich in nutrients, and then the ocean around the sea mount becomes a virtual soup of plankton. such times, hunters gather in astonishing numbers. Bonito, smaller relatives of the tuna. They're searching for still smaller plankton feeders that have been attracted by the bloom. So are these jacks. Their prey is nearby. Chiretta has strayed up near the surface, even though it's broad daylight and hunters are on the prowl. These small fish can already feel the vibrations of the approaching predators. Swimming at speed, they formed into a ball, and now they must wait for whatever comes. seems to dawn the pedals. But now the Bonito arrive and launch the first attack. Still the big ball holds together. Yellowfin tuna move in. The speed of this attack is so great that gradually groups of Achavetta are splintered from the main fish ball. Before long, before long, they're all gone. So it's helpful to be speedy. So, uh, other fish aren't speedy. The angelfish. Others inhabit coral reefs, oyster reefs, other <coughs> similar environments, things where there's a lot of cover. You'll get angelfish. In these fish, the body is not as streamlined, and the fins are feather-like for lots of flexibility. A lot of times you'll find aquarium fish are like this. You 
because aquariums have plants and stuff, and they can dart around, you know, little castles and things. You can't keep a tuna in an aquarium. It's just, it needs too much room. Flexibility allows for greater control around the features that would be seen in a coral reef type environment. Crevices, etc., caves. Again, those big kelp forests, you'll find fish like this. You don't have any tuna running around in kelp forests because they can't maneuver. They'll run into things. Sharks are the same way. You have to uh, have maneuver maneuverability when you're in a, a uh, an area that has a lot of stuff in it. Still copying. fins like this. <coughs> kind of feathery, floppy. Body shapes like this. If you go diving around a coral reef, you'll see, see these things everywhere. Other fish have a shape that allows for camouflage in their environment. So you can not only have camouflage coloring like the octopus, but camouflage shape too. Fish take advantage of both. The toadfish and the stonefish looks like look like rocks or scenery. Um, what's the other one called? The uh, scorpion fish. They sit down there at the bottom of the ocean. They're the same color as their surroundings. They're the same shape as their surroundings. And you really can't see any difference between them. So you, they can use that to hide from predators. They can use that to catch other things. Can you, can you see the fish there? Right there? That's its mouth. Its eyes. Young catfish swim in swarms. Moving in a coordinated fashion, and the video. a school that travels across the seabed in search of food, food, which they ingest by the mouthful. The mass of fish moves continually and confuses predators with its striking designer color scheme. To avoid being hunted down, it's best not to be seen. That's why these tiny little seahorses look more like shards of coral. Cuttlefish take on the color and almost exact shape of the surfaces where they find shelter. Only a very keen, observant eye will notice them.
lost the ability to maneuver as they swim however their camouflage colors and incredibly fast moves make them one of the most efficient predators suck in water as they're striking so the fish gets sucked in their mouth during the strike and some of them have these huge cavernous mouths that can suck in a lot of water and the opercula that cover the gill kind of flap and when they when they open they kind of, kind of pulls in water into their mouth so the thing even if it's swimming away gets pulled in by the current as it's trying to get away. So here's a bunch of different shapes. Uh, this is in your book on page 158. And this is kind of a cross section. If you do a cross section of the body, looking straight down at, there you see tuna are kind of uh, tall, uh, tall and thin and Sea moth, whatever that is, is kind of shorter and flatter. The flatfish is real long and flat, wide and flat, and so forth. It just kind of shows you that there's all sorts of different shapes these things take on. Oh, it's a puffer Me playing with a puffer fish. able to swallow it. And on top of that, it's got these spines that'll hurt. And so whatever's, whatever's eating it will just release it. And there's, they got pretty tough skin that'll resist being, being uh, cut by teeth. So the thing gets the puffer fish in its mouth and chews a little bit, all of a sudden it's expanded, it's sticking the inside of its mouth, it just lets it go. Okay, you need to know about counter shading. The ventral belly area of the fish is lighter than the dorsal area of the fish. Almost all fish have this. Light belly, dark back. Trey. Think about why is that? Why would you have a dark belly? I'm sorry, a light belly and dark back. Disguise. How does that disguise you? Because if you look up, then it's like blended. blended. That's right. Things looking up at a fish from the bottom are looking towards the surface where the sun is, and it's light. So if you got light on the bottom, then they can't see you as easily. If things looking down from the top. The bottom is dark. If you have a dark back, they can't see you as easily. So almost every fish has this. We call it counter shading. Slower swimming fish often have bars or stripes that help break up the silhouette of a fish. We call that disruptive coloration. If you have stripes, and something's looking at you from afar, you'll blend into the background. This is the same reason why zebras have stripes. It makes you blend in when something's seeing you from kind of a long ways away. And you would think, well, the stripes makes you stand out, but that's really not true when you're looking at something from a long ways away. 
If you don't have any stripes, if you're solid, <coughs> that actually makes you stand out because most of an environment looks kind of striped, has some, some detail to it. So disruptive coloration is bars or stripes or something that, that break up your silhouette. Some also have coloration that helps them blend in with the environment called cryptic coloration. Often you'll have splotches on your body of different colors. We call that cryptic coloration. And it breaks up your body too from being one solid color to many colors. And when you look at something that has a lot of different colors, it's hard for an organism to see, oh, that's one thing. It looks like it's several things, which is what the bottom of the ocean looks like. There's, it's patchy, you know, especially like at a coral reef. There's things here, 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 and here. So if your body is several different colors, it just kind of looks like, make you look like part of the reef. And that's cryptic coloration. So we have counter shading, <coughs> disruptive coloration, and cryptic coloration. Multiple choices. You see, multiple choice task? Which does a zebra have? Disruptive. Disruptive coloration. There's the counter shading. Dark on top, light on bottom. Sharks have it. It's not only to help you avoid predators, it's help you catch prey. The prey don't see you coming, and you can get them. Here's some cryptic coloration. You can see the head of this is kind of broken up. This is camouflage. Camouflage is where you're blending in. And this is a type of warning coloration. It's a lion. <coughs> a lion fish. Right. Really, really thick. When I would say jaws that were flyers everywhere, it felt like beware of lionfish. They're really poisonous. Yeah, they'll sting you. We've got a little video here of some. Aposematic coloration is the possession of warning sig signals that advertise dangerous and unpleasant attributes, which are used to deter predators. The conspicuous appearance has been shown to facilitate the learning and maintenance of an avoidance response by potential predators. Warning coloration can evolve fairly easily as long as predators are able to correctly identify toxic prey and avoid making errors. Hence, a conspicuous form greatly facilitates this learning process. A classic marine example is the brilliant coloration and spectacular form of the lionfish. The dorsal spines carry a dangerous toxin that primarily affects the cardiovascular system by lowering the blood pressure to about one to two thirds depending on the dosage amounts. Where was this that you saw the signs? St. John's in the Virgin Islands. Did you see any when you were diving? No, I didn't. Thank God. <laughs> they have them in the, they have a ton of them in the New Orleans Aquarium. Oh, really? Like a tank filled with them. Wow. Has anyone here ever been to the Atlanta Aquarium? Yeah. It's a real nice one. Um, whoops, I left out something. Um, you'll, f you'll find in a lot of fish a spot on one end. That was supposed to be on this slide. A round circular dot on one end of the fish. Like on the red fish? Yeah. Yeah. And what that is is a false eye. And it confuses predators. They're not sure which end of the fish is the head. If they see a, if they see a circle underwater, they think that's an eye. And so what happens is,
here's a fish, and here's the fish's eye. Let's put, let's put a couple fins on the back of it here. Mouth. Now it's starting to look like a fish. A little bit. Okay. So, here's my fish and there's its eye. So if I'm a predator, and I'm going to attack this fish, because I've learned how fish swim, I'm going to go for it right over here. Because I know that as soon as it sees me, it's going to take off this way. You see what I'm saying? So you have to lead the fish a little bit when you're attacking. So they, they'll usually come in from the front like this. And the fish, when it takes off, it goes forward, so it kind of swims into them and they catch them. They learn this pretty quick when you're a predator and you have to eat all day long. You say, oh, if I just lead them a little bit, I got them. Well, so a lot of fish evolve this. A less conspicuous looking eye and a more conspicuous looking dot here. And so if you didn't know any better and you saw that, the fish are pretty... You know, they're pretty good at seeing things, but underwater, it's cloudy. It's You know, you see some fins in the dot, you figure the fish is going to go this way. So you lead it this way, the fish sees you coming, it takes off that way, you're not going to hit it. So you see this on lots of fish. See the dot? Dot. See, the eye's kind of hidden here by this dark color on this one, so it's a lot easier to see that dot. Isn't that cool? The book talks a bit about swimming patterns. Fish have an S-shaped swimming pattern. They move like this through the water. Bands of muscle along the body called myomeres drive the swimming motion. What you get is a band of muscle on one side that shortens and it turns the fish's body. And then the band of muscle on the other side shortens and it turns the fish's body. So if we're looking down on a fish, Here's the fish's body. No, I won't draw eyes. Y'all still writing? Erase this thing. If you look down on a fish's body, there are there are muscle fibers on each side running down the body like this. And so, if these muscle fibers on this side shorten, and what muscles can do is they can shorten. You should have learned that in biology. Muscles can shorten, and if these shorten, it pinches this side of the body in, and the body will curve that way. So if this side of the body gets shorter, the body curves that way. And then this side shortens, and the body curves the other way. So you can imagine, if this side of my body got shorter, my body would be curved. And then if this side got shorter, my body would curve that way. So there's this curving motion that fish are kind of doing through the water. And they do it real fast, and it creates forward thrust. Almost all fish do it to some extent. This is a puffer fish. It's powered mostly by this <coughs> caudal fin. So the caudal fin just goes back and forth. But the same thing here happens. You, these muscles contract and pull it this way. And the muscles on this side contract and pull it the other way. There you 
Mary Gunther's. That was a terrible video, wasn't it? Let's watch it again. It so bad. It's just opposite contractions on, on different sides. see these muscles if looking from the side they kind of appear in zigzag lines. They're called myo <coughs> It talks about how shark's fins are angled, kind of like a, a, a plane's wings have an angle to them, and the angle of the fins provides lift for the shark. As the shark moves its body and swims through the water, the fins are angled this way and it kind of pushes it up in the water. 